Welcome to Deep Dive Dialogue on Shaping the Future of Gynecologic Cancer Care, Integrating Genomic Insights into Precision Oncology. Genomic advancements are transforming gynecological cancer care, enabling precision oncology through molecular profiling and target therapies. In endometrial cancer, molecular classification guides immunotherapy and personalized treatments, improving outcomes. To discuss this, we have with us Dr. Kanika Batra Modi, Principal Consultant and Fellowship Director at MEX Super Speciality Hospital, Saket, New Delhi. Dr. Kanika is a renowned gynecological oncologist with specialized training from Rajiv Gandhi Cancer Institute, Mayo Clinic, and International Fellowships at Royal Hospital for Women, Sydney, and KEM Hospital, Germany. An expert in robotic and laparoscopic surgeries, she specializes in radical procedures for cervical, ovarian, endometrial, vaginal, and vulvar cancers. Actively involved in research, she has published widely and presented globally as an invent, uh, invited speaker. Passionate about awareness, she leads initiatives to educate women on early signs of gynecological cancers. So welcome, Dr. Kanika. Thank you so much, Dr. Manisha, for the kind introduction. Happy to be here. Right. So, Dr. Kanika, could you tell us that what are the main risk factors for endometrial carcinoma and how do hormonal imbalance such as unopposed estrogen exposure contribute to its development? Right. So, endometrial cancer, the incidence is definitely on a rise. And specifically, if you see in the urban areas, it is on an increasing trend and specifically, you know, going into younger population as well. But if we talk about the risk factors, uh, you know, starting with the basic risk factor, like family history is a very important risk factor. And if you have somebody in the family with endometrial or even colorectal cancer, we're talking about Lynch syndrome over here, that increases your risk. Mm -hmm. So age is one thing uh, which, you know, increases incidences of all kinds of cancers. Similarly for endometrial cancer, although we are seeing it in younger and younger women. So with age, it's just like, you know, the nuts and uh, Two, two hit hypothesis. One hit is there, the second hit coming in later. So anything in life increases as you age, your chances of cancer increase, which is why we are seeing, you know, with increasing age, so many cancers being increasing in incidence. Then uh, obesity, as we are talking about it, obesity, the hormonal changes, whether, you know, it's because of polycystic ovarian disease or you're taking exogenous estrogen for some reason, which is unopposed by progesterone, or you know any any other risk factors which lead to an increase in the estrogen. It basically activates a cellular pathway inside the cells. Whenever there is excess of estrogen, the cells proliferate and they do not become secretory which they do with the presence of progesterone. So unopposed estrogen causes them to proliferate, which initially causes hyperplasias. Then it becomes, you know, with atypia, becomes complex, there are polyps. And those are the things that cause the cells to divide. There is a particular pathway that keeps on getting activated because of the presence of estrogen. And then being unopposed by progesterone, it leads to the formation of cancer. Then apart from this, if, uh, you know, somebody is taking certain drugs like tamoxifen, tamoxifen is a known risk factor, although the drug is used to treat breast cancer. But we keep a close watch on any abnormal bleeding if these patients have, because they have an increased risk of endometrial cancer as well. All right. Well, you know, obesity, diabetes, they and you know, hypertension, they form this milieu of inflammation which increase your risk of endometrial cancer. Right. So, Dr. Tanika, uh, what are the methods of diagnosing endometrial carcinoma and how effective are they in identifying the disease in the early stage? So, diagnosis of endometrial cancer in a patient who is symptomatic is what yeah. you're asking? Yeah. Okay. So, how do we diagnose? It's it's basically through a combination of, you know, an abnormal history that a patient comes with. Uh, 
So once you see that there is an abnormal bleeding, whether in the form of postmenopausal bleeding or there is continuous bleeding that is there, intermenstrual bleeding is there, or sometimes, you know, even heavy bleeding in a perimenopausal age group is what, you know, cautions us for an endometrial biopsy. Then you do a basic pelvic examination to rule out all other causes. And mostly in an endometrial cancer, which is confined to the uterus, pelvic examination is absolutely normal. Beyond this, when, when you have suspicion, you go in for a basic thing like a sonography and ultrasound. And doing a transvaginal ultrasound is a very good methodology. It's a very sensitive test to pick up any abnormality in the lining. So it's very important that uh, we understand that if somebody, any woman who comes with a postmenopausal bleeding and the lining is whether it is less than 4 or more than 4 mm. 4 mm is the criteria that we have for postmenopausal women. But somebody who comes with a bleeding, we have to biopsy them, irrespective of the lining. But yes, anything over 4 in even an asymptomatic woman, we need to biopsy. So endometrial biopsy, typically, you know, uh, people do in their office also. But I think a hysteroscopy and DNC is the gold standard method in which you see it. And that's what I typically do. Then as far as the other imaging tests are concerned, MRI is an excellent modality for soft tissue delineation and understanding, you know, if there is a growth in the endometrium, how much has it gone? Although TVS is also very good. And MRI just, you know, sort of consolidates that finding and you get to know about the status of the nodes as well. Got it. So typically these are the imaging that we require for endometrial cancer. Right. And how has the cancer genome atlas classification of endometrial carcinoma into some molecular subtypes impacted your clinical management of the disease? Okay. So the TCGA, you know, it's completely changed the way we practice adjuvant therapy and even, you know, management of endometrial cancer now. So this this was basically one trial and basically they developed a tool. It was a promise trial in which, uh, if I remember the full form correctly, it was proactive molecular risk classifier for endometrial cancer, in which they developed this tool in order to identify four distinct molecular subtypes in an endometrial cancer. So patients were first, you know, uh, their dominant mutation was identified either poly or p53 these are the main things which alter your prognosis because if it's a poly one we know it's a good prognosis irrespective okay. of whether anything else is there or no if it's p53 mutated then we know oh god we're in trouble <laughs> then uh apart from that we also have the mmrt the deficient uh, you know mismatch repair gene when it is deficient the d subtype then also it is there and the fourth one being the non-specific one in which we do not specifically find anything and then you have you know another classification in which they, they have copy number low which has an intermediate prognosis copy number high which has a poor clinical outcome but primarily we now divide it into four it is poly p53 mutant mmr deficient and it is NSMP in which no specific pathology has been found out. So how it changes our management, it's massively changed our management. So even if we have a grade 2 endometroid adenocarcinoma, which is P53 mutated, and suppose it is stage 1, it is now classified as a stage 2C, you know, just by virtue of the P53 mutation being there. Mm -hmm. It changes our classification entirely. So from mm -hmm. 1A, it becomes 2C by the molecular classification and our adjuvant therapy also changes. We have to give them chemo and radiation both. So endometrial cancer initially had been a very enigmatic cancer and we couldn't identify why, you know, this supposedly low risk subgroup, they're developing recurrences, which is what made the scientists study more, do more research in order to come to a better classification. And fully also we haven't, you know, all of our trials are still ongoing. Potec 4A is ongoing, then there's a very good trial, rainbow trial, 
which completely will change the way adjuvant therapy will be there. But right now also, if you ask me, we do change management with respect to what we get. So suppose if it is a P53 and poly mutation together, we would not like to do adjuvant therapy because poly overrides the P53 mutation. And in a low grade, as I told you, if it's a P53 mutant, an early stage also becomes 2C and we give additional chemo and radiation. So this is the way this has changed with respect to P53 and poly. And if we do find an MMR deficient, so initially we do it through IHC, the immunohistochemistry that we find, then we go ahead and get the NGS done in order to identify if there is a Lynch syndrome. That is what we are suspecting. And if we do find that, then obviously we need to do a, a colonic screening apart from the other things that get into the management of a Lynch syndrome. An entire family tree is made and our genetic counselor takes over. Yeah. And uh, my next question would be about the targeted therapies such as AKT inhibitors. Are they being used for elevating uh, carcinoma treatment? So the these pick three inhibitors, hmm. they basically I think they are there in the mTOR pathway, and they're typically there for the uh, advanced stage or recurrent metastatic endometrial cancers. And hmm. it's not it's not given you know typically to begin with early stage or anything, but they are typically given in combination with chemotherapy drugs along with mTOR inhibitors are give, given in a targeted therapy way, like with bevacizumab as well, there, have been a, there has been a trial. Mm -hmm. And I think we need more trials and ongoing studies. And they seem to be promising because that the pathway that they affect is involved in the endometrial cancer. And if we combine it with drugs, it's, it has come out, it's proven to be effective. But definitely more studies are needed. Studies. Right, right. So how do you envision that in the uh, coming future, how do you oversee that uh, endometrial carcinoma management would be changed by doing the genomic research and all? So endometrial cancer management is evolving, if you ask me even right now. There's, there's so much that has happened already with respect to a new classification and the changes in adjuvant therapy. And a lot that will happen with respect to, you know, us being wiser whom to give adjuvant therapy to and whom not to subject to adjuvant therapy because sometimes we just don't understand why is a low-grade tumor behaving in such a way. And this evolution is going to take time. There are too many questions that we have right now amongst, you know, us uh, in the scientific community as people who deal with endometrial cancer. And definitely we're looking for more answers, especially you know, when the recurrences come, they're bad and they're difficult to deal with. And metastatic settings, uh, initially they respond, but the recurrences are so common and it's, it's still enigmatic right now. Yes. And we look so, forward to more and more targeted drugs and more pathways being, um, you know, discovered for it so that we can target it in a much better way with minimizing the side effects so looking forward to the future advancements in molecular and genomic research so that you know cancers can be treated uh, in a better way and we have a better patient outcome thank you so much dr tadika for joining us thank you thank you dr manisha my pleasure it was wonderful speaking to you